Hello and welcome to the Reykjavik Grapevines newscast. My name is Valo Gratison and I am the editor-in-chief at Reykjavik Grapevine. Uh, this is newscast, of course. Uh, we're going to go heavily into the Ukrainian issue and Icelandic response and just the situation in general. It's very connected to Iceland in many ways. Also going to show you how Icelanders have been protesting and so on. But before that, I wanted to remind you a few things. Uh, AMA is tomorrow. Uh, if you want to ask us anything, you can uh, sign up uh, down here, I guess. Uh, also, uh, this week quiz is here, and this is a good one, a nasty one, but it's a good one. Uh, and here is, the, here is it. Which one of these could not be the correct translation for the word hlaup? Uh, is it A, barrel of a gun? Is it B, echo? Or is it C, glacial food? Or is it D, jelly? Or is it E, race? Uh, I think after I'll show you this, perhaps my pronunciation is not perfect when it comes to this, uh, also, uh, the last one, which was t two weeks ago, was uh, we asked which one of these mo months was not the name of the month in Iceland uh, in the olden days. We had different names for the months. Uh, the answer is C, uh, is Eden. She uh, is, of course, the goddess of youth in Norse mythology uh, and therefore not the name of, the, of a month. But the month's name was, were Goa, Harpa and Thorri. Uh, yeah, we basically stopped using that after we adopted the Gregorian calendar. Those are the days, right? Uh, so, the winner randomly picked from the correct answer is Julia Collins from Bournemouth, UK. <laughs> Congratulations. Uh, she will win the Grapevines Do-It-Yourself Mitten Knitting Box. Uh, I love that. I need mittens now, but I can't use it because of this. But uh, this is Polly. She is very excited. Uh, this is the, the Maria May or the Virgin Mary, right? Uh, you know her? Uh, so, we're going to show you a little bit uh, downtown and the Russian embassies and how we have been, yeah, dealing with stuff. We're going to start with the refugee crisis. Um, like, well, perhaps not a crisis. This is just what happens when another country invades another country. <laughs> uh, of course, Russia invaded uh, Ukraine in the 20... What was it? 24th of uh, February, I think. Uh, and uh, now we have refugees from Ukraine, uh, and they are up around four, uh, four mil two millions now, or 4% of the population in Ukraine. Uh, there are, of course, 44 million living uh, in Ukraine. So this is perhaps not that much, but it's the biggest exodus when it comes to refugees in Europe in such a short amount of time. We haven't seen this since Second World War. Uh, so this is a new situation for our generation, at least. Uh, Iceland is expected to, uh, to uh, welcome 2,000 refugees from Ukraine, which is 0.5% of the Icelandic population. Of course, we are not that many in Iceland, so everything feels a bit much when it comes to the percentage. Uh, but just uh, keep in mind, it's like, for example, for the UK to, uh, to welcome 340,000 uh, uh, refugees from Ukraine. So it's, it's pretty obvious that uh, this is going to be quite heavy for uh, the Icelandic uh, uh, like system. Uh, but uh, the, the government have uh, reassured everyone that we will be more than capable of uh, welcoming them all. Not only that, uh, our Ministry of Justice, Jón Gunnarsson, he even uh, welcomed uh, a mother and a daughter, mother and her son from Ukraine uh, to sleep at this uh, place because they couldn't find uh, housing for her uh, immediately. Uh, this was in the media. A friend of his, uh, he asked him about this favor. Uh, and Jón, of course, welcomed them. Whoa. Yeah, perhaps not the best terrain here. But so it goes. Yeah, we have a lot of raining also, and, and therefore the snow is going. And then we have a moment of this. But Polly is pretty good here. Uh, yeah, and the thing is that, of course, the left wing in Iceland, uh, they were very uh, 
like uh, they thought this was scandalous to see the, the Minister of Justice do this, uh, mostly because they thought this was like uh, ironic when it comes to how he has been talking about refugees past weeks. He has been uh, a little bit fleeting about uh, what he has been saying. He has been saying that, uh, well, it's, it's, it's complicated, doesn't really matter, but they're not very happy about it, but they never are. Uh, and uh, at least Jon Gunnarsson, the Ministry of Justice, is doing something. So that's good, at least. Uh, <clears throat> also, Iceland will also provide 2 million euros uh, in human, human, humanitarian relief. Uh, this is, of course, something that will go to the United Nations and the Red Cross. And they will use this money in Ukraine to uh, help uh, when it comes to the refugee situation. Um, and, I mean, it, it's not perhaps, uh, it doesn't sound perhaps a lot, but of course, once again, Iceland is quite a small country, uh, and this is, uh, in Iceland, the corona, this is quite a lot. Oh, you are very energetic. Here you go. Uh, and Iceland, of course, like other countries in the NATO and the EU, have closed their airspace for all Russian aircrafts. Uh, Russian tourists will not be able to to travel to Iceland, of course. I mean, we are not the only ones. They are literally, literally impossible for everyone from Russia to uh, travel here. Wait, wait. <laughs> this is becoming flat out dangerous. Let's get off this ice, right? Let me, I'll, I'll back. Okay. This is more complicated than you actually think. Also to show you how, like, <laughs> How, how Reykjavik is right now. The, the weather has been absolutely horrible for, for weeks now. February was actually the, the, the worst February since 2000. We haven't had such much snow for the longest time. But only February, though, we have often like uh, had uh, worse weather in, in January, for example. Anyways, uh, Russian tourists will not be able to, to travel to Iceland, and it will be, be become much more complicated for Russian diplomats to get into the country. Uh, there are like uh, rules to simplify this process, but they have all been uh, basically uh, like like they have the same situation now as the regular <laughs> as the regular uh, tourists from Russia. Uh, the only the only difference is that they can actually come to Iceland, uh, but uh, other than that, they have to go through a much more complicated process. Which is good. I mean, they have to feel it, so it works. Uh, Icelandic government have also limited their diplomatic relation with Russia, uh, with the Russian government, and will follow NATO and the EU when it comes to this. Uh, they, these, uh, this, like, this is ba pretty basic, though. I mean, it's exactly the same as you have seen other countries been doing, uh, and uh, it's, it's not like uh, doesn't mean much when it comes to Iceland, of course, but everything adds up, right? Uh, it's also expected that more military activity will be visible in Iceland, something that have always been quite controversial. Uh, Icelanders are, like you know very well, uh, without any army, uh, and we have never had an army in Iceland. But we have NATO, of course. We always have this military base. We had, uh, and it was occupied, like, not occupied. There was, uh, there were Russia, there were uh, uh, soldiers from the U.S. were there for the longest time. Uh, and this was always very controversial and uh, like humanitarians and people like striving for peace, they wanted this out. But, uh, uh, but they were the here for decades of years uh, until 2005 or six. Uh, then they actually just uh, like they, they went without almost saying goodbye. <laughs> Icelandic government was quite uh, pissed because of this, uh, mostly because we lost around 1000 jobs. Uh, in, in Reykjavik, Inspire, which is a town where our international uh, airport is. Also, uh, on top of this, uh, the, like experts in Iceland think that uh, Iceland might be uh, like we are basically on the highest alert when it comes to a threat. Uh, this is also interesting because uh, I'm not well. I'm not sure if it's absolutely the highest one, but we're quite high. Uh, and, for example, a uh, specialist has been talking about that uh, possible targets would, for example, be uh, the... What are you doing? Would be the... 
the international airport at Livstöð or Keplavíku flugvöllur. Uh, I, I don't think it's uh, nothing that's going to happen, of course, but uh, it's better to be safer than, than, than sure. Yeah, and you can see here, and it's actually interesting, it's, it's all, all of these uh, poles. Here, the Ukrainian flag is on the poles here, uh, and you will see more of this as we go a little bit forward, because, uh, yeah, because the embassy is here, the Russian one. Uh, Iceland has also agreed upon sanction, uh, sanctions against Belarus. Uh, and this means that the import from the country is very limited. And then we're talking about like tobacco, iron, uh, fuel, of course, and th things like that. It's like, it's not, uh, not even Russia is like a huge market for Icelanders. Uh, it doesn't hurt as much, but the fuel, of course, like in all other countries, uh, is rising very, very rapidly. And this has been happening now uh, in past days. Uh, our fuel has almost doubled since 2017. So, uh, and we think that this would even go higher. Uh, and uh, fuel in Iceland is already incredibly expensive. Always been. Uh, there are high taxes on it. Uh, so this is going to be... Uh, this is going to be not that easy for Icelanders, but a very small sacrifice for what we are actually trying to do here. Uh, and also, uh, yeah, and for all of these reasons, of course, we have now been added to a long list of enemy of Russia. Uh, I don't remember how many countries are, there are, but there are a lot of countries. Uh, all of the EU countries, uh, UK as well as the US, uh, and so on. And it's, uh, it was, uh, and they, they want, they are going to, like, uh, apply uh, their own sanctions on these countries, however that will be. But they say it's going to be smart and we're going to be, we, it's going to hurt us, uh, economically, of course. But it, it's, of course, nothing compared to the, the economical sanction that the, the West has actually uh, uh, agreed on, upon uh, Russia. And, uh, and it's obviously hurting the Russian government very much. Uh, for example, uh, I, I don't know if it's a moment of weakness, I like, if it's like a sign of weakness for the for the Russian army, but uh, the two uh, foreign ministers uh, from Ukraine as well as the uh, Russia, they met in Turkey today, uh, and when they met, they actually uh, it, it did not much did happen. But Erdogan, the president of Turkey, he said he was hoping that this would be that they would open the door. Uh, it would open the door for a permanent truce between the countries. Uh, there is not much to be hopeful about right now, but at least they're talking, and that's basically what it's all about. So, here you have the embassy. Uh, we have two embassies, actually, from the Russian in Iceland. Uh, one of them is like a resident embassy, and the other one is uh, more like offices. You can see here, for example, that someone has been throwing axe here. Uh, not something that you should actually do, uh, in my opinion. Uh, and someone has been uh, throwing uh, red uh, paint. Uh, obviously, a, a symbolic gesture to remind us on the, uh, like the, the, the war, basically, and what that uh, will cost is there. Obviously, it's blood. Uh, there have been very brutal attacks on Mariupol. Uh, they have been like, blowing up children's hospital, and at least according to the news, and it's, uh, it's quite uh, terrible, to be honest. Uh, there were also like a very beautiful uh, protest here the other day. I was just walking to, uh, to work at that day uh, and there was like a choir standing here and they were singing this beautiful uh, hymns. Uh, and they, they said afterwards that they did this because they wanted to remind us on the contrast be between uh, the extremity of a war and the, the beauty.
the protests in Iceland have all been peaceful. Uh, there have been hundreds of people uh, regularly in front of all of these embassies, uh, and these uh, these protests have been more symbolic. They have not like they have been more like uh, Ukrainians uh, as well as Russian actually coming together, and they have been talking like uh, having speeches uh, and and so on. And it's uh, it's quite uh, it's quite uh, nice to see this actually. Uh, I'm very like uh, I'm very glad that uh, these uh, these protests are as they are, because, uh, for example, the, the the ambassador, Russian ambassador in Iceland, he has been in several interviews, of course, in the Icelandic media, and they have been flat out. There, yeah, there are a lot of police also around here. Uh, they are protecting, of course, these embassies, but. Uh, yeah, the, the ambassador of Russia has been in these just flat out bizarre interviews. He has been basically saying the same things as the, like, he has been like uh, repeating the, what do you call it, like the propaganda that you can find in Russia. Uh, and and uh, Icelanders, they completely lost, uh, basically, like, uh, if, they ever, if they ever had any good with Russians, it disappeared there. Perhaps just go over the street. No cars. Jaywalking, I won't hurt anyone with it, will it? Yeah, here's an embassy also. And they, uh, in the night, they always light it up with the Ukrainian uh, flag lights. It's beautiful. Uh, so, the thing is, of course, that uh, even like in Icelandic, like most popular, uh, like uh, political debate show, uh, they were actually talking about uh, uh, th these bizarre reactions from the Russian ambassador. Uh, and Icelanders have often had quite nice ambassadors from Russia. One of them, for example, uh, spoke Icelandic fluently. Uh, and Icelanders liked him quite a, quite a lot. Uh, and th they have had like a pretty like positive uh, relationship when it comes to this. But we have never, because of NATO, of course, had any serious uh, relationship in diplomatic kind of way with the Russians. Uh, but also, like, uh, on top of this, there was a poll on the other, the other day. Uh, and in this poll, Iceland was asked, like, uh, what do you think about the, the war? And 99% of Icelanders said, actually, that they were opposed to the war and opposed to the invasion of Russia or the special military operation. Yeah, this is the other one. Here is the offices. And 99% said they, they uh, think this is appalling. Uh, interestingly enough, I have never seen this number ever in Icelandic polls. Like, it's, it's incredible to see this. 99%. I don't know what this 1% is thinking, but I'm guessing they're Russians. Uh, or they are like, many Icelanders are often, uh, some of us like are, of course, like old socialists, old communists, very stuck in, t in the, the old um, trenches of the Cold War, if you will. Uh, <clears throat> Yeah, and no, finally, like, uh, the, the invasion of uh, unified Icelanders in an odd way, actually. For example, NATO has always been quite controversial in Iceland. But now Icelanders have never been as positive when it comes to NATO. And this is, of course, also just unifying the Western world, as you have seen, of course. Uh, and another, like, uh, here is another example of how uh, Icelanders have been pro protesting. Uh, this is, of course, like red paint again, and you can see there are some acts that have been thrown there. Uh, the the amb embassy has said that they will not, uh, they will not clean this. They will, they want the police to find the one that is responsible, and they want him to clean this. So this has been on these walls now for uh, almost from the beginning of the war, which is interesting because uh, most of these embassies, they actually would, like, you would think that they would. Uh, and make this like clean this, but uh, they're not. They're going to stand to this. Uh, and finally, we actually have a Ukrainian intern in our office. Uh, I'm just mentioning this because it, 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 just to show you, like how how uh, like close this war is, uh, even to Icelanders in many ways. She came here before the war, and now she has found herself self with with a home country in war. Thankfully, of course, the EU regulation when it comes to uh, 
uh, to anyone that is from Ukraine applies. That is, you can be in these countries, under other countries in Ukraine, in the EU countries, uh, think for as long as you want to, and you have much stronger rights, for example, than if you would be coming from a uh, place like from uh, beyond Europe, like from Afghanistan, Syria, and so on. And not even Syria. Syria, actually, they can come pretty easily, actually, as asylum seekers. Uh, so, uh, this is uh, basically the end of the newscast. Uh, I just want to say in the end, uh, I mean, I don't even need to tell you this, but uh, this war is, of course, uh, is, it, we feel like this is a very brutal attack on, uh, like, like our ideas about democracy. Uh, and, and Icelanders are very shocked about this as well as the, the Volta course. And it's, uh, it's quite hard to watch these news, uh, to see these people coming to Iceland. But at least when it comes to Icelanders, we are very uh, hopeful that this will not be a long war. Uh, and we are also quite hopeful that, uh, uh, the, uh, that the refugees that will come to Iceland, that they will have a home to, to return to very quickly on. Uh, but uh, until then, of course, uh, we support Ukraine in, in everything. Uh, either way, is, is the Reykjavik grapevine, uh, the government, or just whatever coffee house you go to. Everybody is, is standing with the Ukrainian nation in this absolutely absurd war, to be honest. And also, one thing in the end uh, I want to mention, the Russians. Uh, Icelanders don't view this as a war between Russia and, and Ukrainians. Ukrainians. They see this much of uh, Putin against Ukraine. Uh, a lot of Russians have been in the discussion in, in Iceland. Uh, for example, in this same t political debate show I told you about, where they were talking about the bizarre answers of the um, um, embassy. Uh, and they were saying that this is really hard also for the Russian public. If you're young, you have more correct information. But if you're older, you are more likely to be watching uh, the, the, the state news stations and so on, and, and therefore perhaps not having the right uh, information, basically, on what, what's going on. Also, a country that actually put a journalist into jail for 15 years for calling a war a war, is obviously an authoritarian uh, state. It, it's fascist, <laughs> simple as that. Uh, so it's, it's quite shocking for us to see this. It's quite shocking for journalists to see this. And uh, I've like, uh, I mean, and I basically, uh, I really admire the courage of the people that are actually standing up in Russia and go out to protest, uh, knowingly, knowing that they will be arrested no matter what. And it's, uh, that, that is a very courageous stand to take. So, uh, let's go on. I'll see you on Tuesday. Uh, remember, of course, our podcast uh, is it, doing quite fine. So listen more. Uh, if, you haven't, if you haven't listened to it, then li li listen to it. You can find it on Spotify and so on. AMA, of course, uh, and our newsletter and membership. We have a membership. So if you want to be a part of the membership, please uh, check that out. So. Thanks for watching. Hi.